Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, uh, we are into lecture 2 of our course ADR and arbitration and before I start discussing the history, evolution and growth of law of arbitration, let us quickly uh, recall whatever we discussed in the first lecture. We defined the term conflict if you remember a stage, a state of hostility we tried to understand the defects in existing justice delivery system, what are the problems in court system, how litigation is facing the problem of docket explosion, what is the extent of pendency. We referred to the advantages and features of ADR in the last session. We also discussed what are the kinds of ADR mechanism which are possible. There are some basic ADR mechanisms like arbitration, conciliation, negotiation, mediation and there are certain hybrid processes where we uh, discuss the meaning of terms like med arb, mini trial, concilio arbitration. I also used the term early neutral ev evaluation at some stage. So we saw that uh, in civil cases ADR is proving to be a useful substitute of existing justice delivery system. And I also said that I will be emphasizing uh, on arbitration more. So from this session onwards for our next 19 sessions, uh, we will have different aspects of law of arbitration for you. It is also said that ADR is not a viable option for criminal justice system. Uh, it is not a good substitute for criminal courts. ADR is not possible in criminal cases. Now, before I start talking about arbitration, I may mention that uh, in criminal law, in CRPC, you have list of compoundable offences. ADR is very much possible in cases of compoundable offences. Uh, plea bargaining is, is also one in one way or the other is an example of ADR where, where if my conviction is based on my pleading guilty, then I must be given some concessional treatment. So that is where I am accepting a part of my guilt to get some concession with respect to remaining part of my of, of the charge. So plea bargaining is also in one way an example of ADR. In countries like US you have concepts like victim offender mediation where the victim and offender are asked to sit across the table and if uh, the victim feels sufficiently compensated the matter is withdrawn. So, there are examples of ADR in criminal justice system also. So, you cannot, we cannot straight away say that ADR is good only in cases uh, of civil matters. So, that is what we discussed. I added few things to, to whatever we discussed in lecture 1. Now, uh, in this session, I will talk about history, evolution and growth of law of arbitration. You can see the keywords I have written here, Ancitral, Geneva Convention, New York Convention. So after this session, you will be in a position to explain or understand as to how the law of arbitration evolved from 18th century to the present at domestic level, at international level. What is the present legal framework which we have in our country? What is the structure of Arbitration Conciliation Act 1996 which we have? So these are the aspects which you will uh, learn in this session and this session will form the basis, the foundation for remaining 18 sessions precisely on various aspects of law of arbitration. You see the history of our law of arbitration, I won't go before 1770s because from 1772 to 1827 for the first time, government of that time gave legislative form to the law of arbitration by way of regulations. Regulations were made to give statutory status, legislative status to the process of arbitration. 
we had regulations of Calcutta, Madras, Bombay. Now, this was the beginning of a new thing at that stage. So, obviously, it lacked uniformity. The regulations lacked uniformity. The clarity was missing. The details were missing. The important thing to be noticed here is that during these, this period from 1772 to 1827, whatever regulations came, all these regulations provided for court-induced arbitration, something similar to what is there in section 89 of CPC. Court-induced arbitration, if you recall in the last class, I said section 89 says, if the presiding officer of the court is of the opinion that there exists element of settlement between the disputing parties, if the presiding officer thinks that there exists element of settlement between the disputing parties, then presiding officer shall formulate the terms of settlement and refer the parties for, arbitra for arbitration or, or mediation or conciliation, whatever. So, this is not a case of voluntary arbitration. It is a case where court is asking you to go for arbitration. Such arbitrations may be called as court-induced arbitration or arbitration in suit because the matter is already there in court, suit is going on. So, it is arbitration in suit or court-induced arbitration. As I mentioned, section 89 is an opt-out provision where, the, where you get a chance to come out of litigation at, at a stage where the judge thinks that there exists element of settlement. Now, this kind of mechanism is something which, which, was, which was evolved by the regulations of Calcutta, Bombay and Madras. And these regulations were extended beyond these presidency towns. For example, the 1793 uh, Bengal regulation was extended to my city of Banaras in 1795. So, we have law of arbitration since 1795. This was the first stage of evolution of law of arbitration by way of regulations. The second stage comes when we get the Code of Civil Procedure Act of 1859. The importance of this code is that we had two set of provisions, section 312 to section 325, which dealt with arbitration in suits, court induced arbitration, something similar to section 89 of CPC. So, 312 to 325, these many provisions dealt with arbitration in suits. And there were two provisions, 326 and 327, which provided for arbitration without court intervention. Now, arbitration without court intervention means voluntary arbitration, consensual arbitration. It remains consensual even if it is court induced because court is required to seek your consent before referring you to arbitration. But it is not voluntary in the true sense, which for the first time came by sections 326 and 327 under the Code of Civil Procedure Act 1859, pure voluntary consensual arbitration came in 1859. So, from regulations, we came to the Code of Civil Procedure Act. From only court-induced arbitration phase to court-induced as well as voluntary arbitration. That is how it evolved. Then, there were two more Code of Civil Procedure Acts, 1877 and 1882, Code of Civil Procedure Act 1877 and Code of Civil Procedure Act 1882. Now, by way of these codes, what we did, we repealed the 1859 Act. 1859 Code of Civil Procedure Act provided for two set of provisions, one for court-induced arbitration, the other was for voluntary arbitration. Now, all those was repealed, but interestingly, the provisions of arbitration, the code was repealed, but the provision related to arbitration was retained in the new codes. In 1882 Code of Civil Procedure Act from section 506 to section 526, we retained the law relating to arbitration which we had in the old Code of Civil Procedure Act of 1859. So, how we evolved from regulations, 18th century regulations, which were expanded to various other territories 
these regulations had limitations these regulations talked about court induced arbitration from there we came out with code of civil procedure act which provided for court induced arbitration as well as voluntary arbitration now this code of civil procedure act was repealed still the provision on arbitration was retained by subsequent code of civil procedure acts of 1877 and 1882 that is one part where arbitration was part of civil procedure code mostly for the first time in 1899 a systematic indian arbitration act was passed a systematic exclusively on arbitration a systematic arbitration act was passed in the year 1899 this act was based on british arbitration act of 1889 10 years ago so england framed the arbitration act in 1889 and indian arbitration act was made in 1899 10 years after british law it was completely based on the british arbitration law this new law was made applicable to presidency towns only but as as i said that we were in the initial phase when the law of arbitration was only evolving so we saw the working of this arbitration act 1899 presented complex problems there were unaddressed issues in the act so what i'm trying to say in the year 1899 we have two set of laws one the arbitration act and the other cpc the code of civil procedure act code of civil procedure act also provided for arbitration in an arbitration act also provided for arbitration now let's move ahead from 1899 onwards in the year 1908 your present cpc comes into existence we have started from regulations to code of civil procedure acts three acts followed by what the indian arbitration act now during this journey in the year 1908 your present cpc comes code of civil procedure comes and initially this code of civil procedure 1908 had two schedules schedule 1 and schedule 2 which provided for arbitration now code of civil procedure by way of schedule 1 and schedule 2 supplemented the indian arbitration act of 1899 so let us conclude in the year 1908 we have two laws one is indian arbitration act 1899 which was applicable in the presidency towns only presidency towns of calcutta bombay and madras so the indian arbitration act was applicable to presidency towns of bombay calcutta and madras only and for rest of the country we had code of civil procedure 1908 which had schedule 1 and schedule 2 which supplemented the indian arbitration act and applied to mufassil areas this was one part of the story now in the 20th century as you will also understand the international trade started increasing and with increasing international trade the disputes of international nature also started coming into existence now there will be problem of jurisdiction if i belong to country a you belong to country b we are transacting we are doing some business we are doing some trade and in the process there is a dispute between you and me which court will have jurisdiction court of which country will have jurisdiction which law will be applied so these may be difficult areas to determine so as international trade increases the conflicts and disputes of international nature also started increasing and therefore people started searching for an alternative to the court system where we have the issues of jurisdiction involved which country will have jurisdiction which court will have jurisdiction can a court in india ensure attendance of a witness from some other country can the court in india ensure attendance of a party who belongs to some other country such issues came into existence so with increasing international disputes countries started looking for a solution to these jurisdictional issues and other related issues and therefore two international documents came into existence one is called the geneva protocol on arbitration clauses 1923 the geneva protocol on arbitration clauses 1923 and the other is the geneva convention on the execution of foreign arbitral awards 1927 let us try and understand arbitration as i said in the first session 
arbitration is a method of resolving the dispute but it is it has features of litigation also arbitration is not pure adr it is similar to adr only in the sense that it is based on consent of the parties but is more like adversarial process where there are two disputing parties in front of the arbitrator who will apply rules and laws as chosen by the parties to pass an award so he is a neutral third party who will apply rules which have been decided by the parties parties will decide which law will apply but who will apply it a neutral third party in what manner by way of passing an award and what shall be the status of that award that award is final and binding between the parties it is binding on the parties and it is final with respect to the subject with which it deals with so therefore it has features of litigation so what we are studying is arbitration which has features of adr as well as litigation arbitration leads to award that award can be domestic award foreign award depending on the place where you pass that if an award is passed by an arbitral tribunal in india the award is a domestic award if the award is passed in an by an arbitral tribunal in some other country in a foreign country that becomes a foreign award now the real issue was you see indian award according to indian law can be enforced in india but how will you enforce a foreign award try and understand a foreign decree can be enforced in india you must have studied in cpc a foreign decree can be enforced in india by the mechanism of cpc but how will you enforce a foreign arbitral award in india so therefore in order to ensure that foreign arbitral awards are enforced in different countries this convention was prepared there are two international documents one is called geneva protocol on arbitration clauses 1923 the other is geneva convention on the execution of foreign arbitral awards this is 1927 these two together will provide a mechanism for enforcement of a foreign arbitral award so if india is a party of geneva convention then india is obliged to honor and respect an arbitral award which is passed in some other geneva convention country in some other country which is a member of geneva convention because it was understood that in relation to foreign awards it is the mu mu it is the mutual trust which binds the international arbitrating community together you agree to enforce awards passed in india i agree to enforce awards passed in your country so this this mutual trust is the glue which binds international arbitrating community together so what i was trying to explain whatever law we discussed in the form of indian arbitration act 1899 cpc schedule 1 schedule 2 all these related to domestic arbitration india seated arbitration when it is done in india for the first time there is an international document which talks about enforcement of an award passed in foreign seated arbitration now in order to incorporate the principles of the geneva protocol and geneva convention we enacted a law called as arbitration protocol and convention act 1937 arbitration protocol and convention act 1937 enacts the obligations of geneva protocol and geneva convention and therefore by virtue of this act now india accepts to enforce foreign awards which may be called as geneva convention awards we are not concerned under this act of 1937 arbitration protocol and convention act 1937 under this act we are not obliged to enforce all the foreign awards we are obliged to enforce only those foreign awards which may be called as geneva convention awards which are passed in a country which is a member of geneva convention and one of the parties is from a geneva convention country i will not go in detail of the definition of geneva convention award right now 
we have it in in some other lecture this act will apply to any award which is passed in a foreign country a geneva convention country and it is passed in relation to a dispute which is considered as commercial according to laws for the timing in force in india so it must be commercial according to indian laws now let me tell you even today this word commercial creates a lot of subjectivity because there is a line of argument that something which may be commercial in the context of india may not be commercial in the american context so this word commercial has element of subjectivity so what is commercial here must be commercial everywhere that's the point so this act of 1937 applied to the matters which are considered as commercial it operated on the principle of reciprocity india will enforce the awards passed in england provided england agrees to enforce the awards passed in india so it is based on the principle of reciprocity the act of 1937 arbitration protocol and convention act 1937 provided for filing of foreign awards for the purpose of enforcement a foreign arbitral award has to be filed in a court in india for its enforcement now regarding rules high courts were empowered to provide rules make rules so as to provide details with respect to the act of 1937 now in the year 1937 therefore we have three laws one is 1899 arbitration law for domestic arbitration india city arbitration only applicable to presidency towns of calcutta bombay madras second law was code of civil procedure 1908 schedule 1 schedule 2 it applied to rest of india but it applied only with respect to domestic arbitration india city arbitration and third law which was made for the purpose of enforcement of foreign arbitral awards was the arbitration protocol and convention act 1937 these three laws were there in the year 1937 and then in the year 1940 all the law of arbitration which we had till 1940 in the form of indian arbitration act 1899 and cpc schedules all that is clubbed into one law called as the arbitration act 1940 so in the year 1940 we have two laws therefore the arbitration act 1940 was for domestic arbitration and the arbitration protocol and convention act 1937 was for foreign awards so what i am trying to say in the year 1940 we had two laws one for enforcement of foreign awards the other is for domestic arbitration because you see as i said during 20s and 30s international trade increased and you will appreciate that after independence india's participation in international trade increased we started participating in trade and commerce and a realization came that the trading community the business community is more inclined in favor of choosing arbitration as a preferred mode of dispute resolution instead of going to litigation instead of going to court now in addition to these two laws there is one more development which i would like to refer to in the year 1958 a new international convention comes which is called as new york convention 1958 india was one of the signatories of new york convention new york convention was relatively a modern convention an advanced document as compared to geneva document it also relates to recognition and enforcement of foreign arbitral award so till 1940 we had 1937 act for enforcement of geneva awards 1940 act for the purposes of domestic arbitration then in the year 1958 a new convention comes called as new york convention new york convention i said is is a better version of geneva convention it is an advanced document it relates to recognition and enforcement of foreign arbitral award this new york convention 
was incorporated in Indian law called as the Foreign Awards Recognition and Enforcement Act 1961. So, the New York Convention 1958, because India was one of the signatories of New York Convention, it becomes part of Indian law by way of the Foreign Awards Recognition and Enforcement Act 1961. We will talk about foreign awards later on in some other lecture. What we, it, I, I am just trying to tell you uh, the different phases of evolution of law of arbitration in India, how it evolved and how it came to the present form, which we will discuss in Arbitration Conciliation Act 1996. Now, this act, Foreign Awards within brackets, Recognition and Enforcement Act 1961, it contained 11 sections and the text of New York Convention. It was New York Convention was a successor to Geneva document, Geneva Protocol, Geneva Convention. New York Convention is a successor to Geneva documents. New York Convention applies to foreign seated arbitration. New York Convention applies to any, any arbitration which has foreign element and which has to do with international trade. Now, you see, I have been using two words here. The Foreign Awards Recognition and Enforcement Act 1961. Why do we have these two words? What do we mean by recognition? What do we mean by enforcement? Recognition is a defensive process, whereas enforcement is, is a weapon of attack. What I am trying to say, recognition is a shield and once an award is recognized, the same issue cannot be raised before any other court or any other tribunal between same parties. So, recognition means this much only. If an award between A and B is recognized by an Indian court, it means that between A and B, same issue cannot be litigated, same issue cannot be arbitrated. This is something which we call as principle of res judicata. It is a civil law principle, CPC principle, you must be aware. Same issue between same parties cannot be litigated time and again. The subsequent action between same parties in relation to same matter will be barred by the principle of res judicata. So, recognition operates in the form of res judicata. Once a foreign award is recognized, that means the same matter between same parties cannot be arbitrated again, cannot be litigated again. Whereas, enforcement, as I said, is a weapon of attack. It is a more comprehensive concept. Enforcement presupposes recognition. You cannot enforce it or apply it unless, first of all, you recognize it. So, recognition is a necessary part of enforcement. So, therefore, what I am trying to say is, although New York Convention uses both the terms recognition and enforcement, Although the act of 1961 which we made so as to incorporate New York Convention principles in Indian law use both the terms recognition and enforcement. Use of both the terms is superfluous, is not required because recognition is very much part of the enforcement and therefore in the present law we only use the word enforcement in part 2 of the Arbitration Conciliation Act, we will talk about it. So, Therefore, in the year 1961, you have Arbitration Act of 1940 for domestic arbitration and you have two laws, one 1937 Act for Geneva documents and second 1961 Act for New York Convention. These two are for enforcement of foreign arbitral awards, an arbitral award passed in a foreign situated arbitration, foreign seated arbitration. That was the scheme in the year 1961 and then we move ahead. Domestic Arbitration 1940 Act, Enforcement of Foreign Awards 1937 Act and 1961 Act. There is a difference between 37 Act and 61 Act. 37 Act talks about enforcement of those foreign awards which may be called as Geneva Convention Awards. We will learn the definition later on. 
1961 talks about enforcement of those foreign awards which may be called as New York Convention Awards. We will see the definition. Now, as we move ahead, Law Commission of India in the year 1978 came out with its recommendation and one of the strong recommendation was to amend 1940 Arbitration Act. Keep in mind the three e laws which I mentioned, the Arbitration Act 1940, the Act of 1937 Geneva documents, the Act of 1961 for New York Convention document. So, there are three laws. Out of these three, 1940 was under scanner of Law Commission of India and Law Commission recommended that 1940 Act be amended because, because by 1978, by the time Law Commission gave its report, there was a realization that 1940 Arbitration Act is becoming very technical. It is becoming technical mainly because of increasing court intervention in the arbitral process. Court has now started intervening more and more in the process of arbitration. As I said, the advantage of arbitration is its flexibility. If you allow court intervention, too much of court intervention, that will disturb the balance of this act and will make it more technical. So, as court intervention was increasing, therefore, Law Commission recommended amendments in 1940 Act. There are few observations of Supreme Court of India. For example, in the year 1981, Supreme Court in the case called as Guru Nanak Foundation versus Ratan Singh and Sons, AIR 1981, Supreme Court 2075. In this case, Supreme Court observed that proceedings under the 1940 Arbitration Act have become highly technical, indicating towards a requirement to amend the law, to make it less technical. Because if it becomes technical, it loses the very essence of the process, the very purpose for which we have ADR, for which we have arbitration. Again in the year 1990, in a case called as Raipur Development Authority versus Chokhamal Contractors, EIR 1990, Supreme Court 1426, the Supreme Court said in relation to Arbitration Act 1940, the court said that indeed this branch of the system of dispute resolution has acquired a certain degree of notoriety. See how the law is changing. There was no law, 18th century regulations came, Code of Civil Procedure Act came. Finally, we got a law for domestic arbitration, exclusively for domestic arbitration, two laws for enforcement of foreign awards and now there are criticism against the law of 1940, which was there for domestic arbitration. And the criticism is coming from all possible corners, Law Commission criticizing it, requesting the parliament to amend the law, Supreme Court time and again making observations that this branch of dispute resolution has become highly technical. This branch of dispute resolution has acquired certain degree of notoriety, all these indicating towards a need to amend the law. But we should amend it on what lines was not very clear during 1980s or in early part of 1990s. Towards 19, late, late part of 1970s and in the early part of 1980s, we were not sure as to what shall be the line on which we must modify the Arbitration Conciliation Act, Arbitration Act 1940. Now, let us understand the background of the new act, that is Arbitration and Conciliation Act 1996. Till 1996, the same old 1940 law operated in India, but was criticized as I said. Now, what was the background, I will tell you. There is a body called as UNCITRAL, U-N-C-I-T-R-A-L, UNCITRAL. This is UN Commission on International Trade Law. This was established by the General Assembly of the United Nations in the year 1966, right. So, UNCITRAL was established by UN General Assembly and the role of UNCITRAL, the responsibility of UNCITRAL was to ensure harmonization of law relating to international trade. 
so it had responsibility to promote harmonization of international trade law what do we mean by harmonization the role of ancitral was to ensure that trade related legislations in different countries are by and large same if the laws in different countries with respect to trade matters are harmonized are are unified are identical that's a very good stage for promotion of international trade so essentially the important function of ancitral was to find out means to promote international trade in goods etc now this ancitral had a role in international trade but there is another body called as asian african legal consultative committee asian african legal consultative committee suggested to ancitral the un commission to consider the possibility of preparing a protocol to be annexed to the new york convention 1958 on the recognition and enforcement of foreign arbitral awards so the asian african legal consultative committee proposed to ancitral to kindly work in the direction of bringing some changes by way of attaching a protocol to the new york convention 1958 some clarifications in relation to existing new york convention was required and on june 21st 1985 ancitral instead of proposing any protocol to be annexed to the new york convention what they preferred they preferred to propose a model law on international commercial arbitration try and understand ancitral was given the mandate to promote international trade why should a body which has been given the mandate to promote international trade why should such a body propose a law on arbitration it also proposed a model law on e-commerce one can understand that e-commerce is part of trade law the best situation for growth of international trade is when you do not have international borders that will be a stage when there will be free flow of goods free movement of goods that stage can be achieved only when there is nothing in the physical world an entire trade goes on to the mode of e-commerce so one can understand that a body which has been given the responsibility to promote international trade can propose a model law on e-commerce but why should this body propose a model law on arbitration i'll give you an example let's quickly understand it suppose there is a company in some european country which is a member of european union there is a country which is a member of european union since it is a member of european union it is bound by all the eu directives eu laws one of the eu directive european union directive is european union database directive it says that nobody will send any data any personal data belonging to a european nation a citizen of european nation to any other country which does not give same level of protection to data as europe gives you understand so there is a company in in france it collects information about its subscribers now that information has to be used to cater to their demands by way of call centers so they have to establish a call center but they prefer to establish it in some other country for example they want to establish it in india when they want to establish that call center in india they will have to transfer the entire data which they have collected in their country to india they cannot do it by virtue of european database directive which says that you cannot transfer this data to any country which does not give same protection to data as europe gives since there is no data protection law in india so therefore ideally according to da database directive of europe 
that data information about subscribers cannot come to India. So what they will do? They will enter into an agreement with the Indian company. We are handing over the data to you. You will be attending my customers in, 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 in Europe. In return, the Indian company says that we undertake to protect your data in the same way as you do in your country. So it is not done by law in India. It is done by contract between two parties, Indian company and that foreign company, European company. Now what happens? I am working in the Indian company. Tomorrow I leave my company. I steal some data, sell it to some other country, sell it to some other company. I leave my job, steal some data, sell it to some other company or give it to some other company. What all will happen? Listen to me carefully. The Indian company will file a case against me, breach of confidentiality, some agreement I must have signed with that Indian company. I have committed breach of that agreement. That European company will file a case against Indian company in Indian court because the cause of action, the breach has happened in India. The contract between European company and Indian company was made in India. So the Indian court will have jurisdiction. So Indian company files a case against me in Indian court. The European company files a case against Indian company in India and all the citizens of that country whose data have been leaked will file cases against European company in that European country, right? Indian cases will take 10 years, 20 years. That European case will take six months eight months. So no European company will prefer to go for litigation. And litigation therefore or delay in litigation therefore is not conducive for international trade. The whole outsourcing business will collapse if I ask that European company to go to litigation in case of any dispute. They will never prefer that option. So therefore, in every such contract, which I mentioned between Indian company and European company, in every such contract, you will have an arbitration clause that in case any dispute arises between you and me, we will not go to court, we will not go to litigation, we will go for arbitration. Why? Because it is time bound, it is not done as part of existing court system. So it is good even for international trade that your justice administration system is efficient. Since court system cannot be modified to an extent that it becomes absolutely efficient. So therefore Ancitral which had the responsibility to promote international trade proposed model law on international commercial arbitration. Because if we have a good robust arbitration law in India, then international trading community will have faith in our system and they will be willing to enter into agreements with Indian partners. So therefore, efficient justice administration system, efficient dispute resolution system, quick dispute resolution system, time bound dispute resolution system will promote international trade. Therefore, General Assembly of United Nations established Ancitral. Ancitral was given the responsibility to promote international trade. And in the process, Ancitral proposed a model law. A model law in the year 1985. And Ancitral wants all the countries to adopt this model law. And if all the countries adopt the same model law, that will be harmonization of laws. If all the countries adopt same model law, the laws will be identical. That is the best situation. If I know that all the countries will have laws similar to Indian law, predictability, certainty, that is the best situation for international trade. So what Ancitral wants us to do, it wants us to adopt the Ancitral model law in its entirety. But if we do not want to adopt it in its entirety, then we must at least adopt it substantially, if not entirely, adopt it substantially. If 
we are not willing to adopt it substantially, even then, Ancitral says, if all the countries adopt general shape and philosophy, that will be good enough for harmonization. Model law was codified in India in the year 1996 and we made the law called as Arbitration Conciliation Act 1996. There are two methods of adopting any international document. You see, Ancitral was asked to do something with respect to, give some proposal with respect to New York Convention. They preferred to give a model law. They did not prefer a hard law approach to bring harmonization. They preferred a soft law approach. Model laws are soft law approach. These are not binding. We are giving you an indicative legislation. Go back, adopt it, you will be happy. So, it is indicative, it is not binding. Whereas, hard law approach, the treaty approach is binding approach. Now, Ancitral did not follow that. It instead pr proposed a model law which is to be adopted by all the countries. As I said, adoption, adoption of model law can be done by two methods. One is called adoption by incorporation and the other is called direct adoption. First is adoption by incorporation by reference. What do we do? Singapore did that. I will enact a law in which I will say that for all purposes, the ancestral model law 1985 shall be the law of India. So, I have not done anything. I have referred to that document and incorporated in my law. This is one way of, of adoption. The second way is direct adoption, which India preferred. In which what we do? We take every article of ancestral, adopt it if no changes are required. And if some changes are required, make it suitable to Indian context and then adopt it. So, therefore, direct adoption is a better method of adoption in which we take each and every article, discuss it, examine it, modify it if modifications are required. That is what we did. And with few exceptions, few differences between Indian law, Indian law and model law, by and large, substantially, the ancestral model law has been enacted in the form of Arbitration Conciliation Act 1996. The Indian Act of 1996 preserves party autonomy in the arbitral process. This is the most important word in law of arbitration, party autonomy. And I will be referring to a good number of provisions of Arbitration Conciliation Act throughout my lectures. There is a phrase which we will come across in Arbitration Conciliation Act, unless otherwise agreed by the parties, this shall be the law how to decide what shall be the law applicable to arbitration. This shall be the law unless otherwise agreed by the parties. This shall be the procedure unless otherwise agreed by the parties. This shall be the method of hearing unless otherwise agreed by the parties. So, therefore, if parties want to agree for something else, they can decide. That is party autonomy. They decide the time, they decide the place, they decide the procedure, they decide the procedural law. They decide whether hearing has to be done. They decide whether reasoning is to be given in award. Many things. Indian law preserves party autonomy in the arbitral process. But in the name of party autonomy, we cannot allow parties to take a decision against their own interest. So, Indian law, apart from recognizing, acknowledging party, party autonomy, it also provides certain mandatory provisions. These have to be necessarily followed. So, Indian law gives you a very good balance of party autonomy provisions and mandatory provisions. We will talk about the balance later on in other, other lectures. So, what I said, Ancetral proposed the model law. We followed the model law to make our Arbitration Conciliation Act 1996. We have preferred direct adoption where we took each article of Ancetral rephrased it maybe or modify it maybe a bit to suit our conditions and drafted it in the form of Arbitration Conciliation Act. Indian Act is based on four pillars. First, the Arbitration Conciliation Act 1996 is based on four pillars. First is general principles. The first pillar on which Indian Act is based is general principles. 
there are few general principles point number 1 the law provides a fair procedure speedy procedure and inexpensive procedure i won't say arbitration is very inexpensive because a lot of money is involved there but it definitely provides you a fair procedure and a speedy procedure as i mentioned in the last session also section 29 a gives you the timeline within which an arbitration has to be completed arbitration must be completed in the time period of 12 months it's a very speedy process and i said if you opt for a fast track arbitration process it must be completed in 6 months time unless the time period is extended either by the parties or by the court so it provides a fair process speedy process how fair process fairness is ensured in the process of arbitration if a party believes that he was not given sufficient opportunity to defend his case and therefore the tribunal was not fair to him he can raise this point as a ground to challenge the arbitral award in section 34 we'll discuss it it's a fair code it ensures that the tribunal remains fair to both the parties tribunal is not biased section 12 will discuss section 12 section 12 ensures that the arbitrators are not biased so by all these mechanism the the act ensures fair trial speedy trial point number 2 it preserves party autonomy i already mentioned it party autonomy means lot of choices are to be made by the parties the third point is judicial minimalism judicial minimalism is a principle which is incorporated in section 5 of the act section 5 says there are certain provisions in which judicial intervention is permissible the extent is also mentioned beyond that no more judicial intervention is permissible there are provisions like section 8 9 11 very limited 10 or 12 provisions in the entire act where there is a possibility of judicial intervention so judicial intervention has been kept at minimum possible level so first pillar is general principles party autonomy judicial minimalism fair procedure speedy procedure the second pillar is the general duty of the tribunal section 18 of your act arbitration conciliation act 1996 is based on articles 18 and 19 of the model law section 18 can be called as magna carta of this act it is a equality provision of this act the tribunal has to remain fair and equal to both the parties the, du the duty of the tribunal is to assure the parties of fair trial and impartial trial the third pillar is general duty of the parties parties under this act are obliged to do everything necessary for proper and expeditious conduct of the proceeding parties cannot sabotage the success of the process of arbitration the fourth pillar is balance between mandatory and non mandatory provisions if you recall i just mentioned that party autonomy must not lead to a situation where parties themselves start suffering too much of party autonomy may go against the interest of parties so therefore there are certain mandatory provisions a balance has been maintained between mandatory and non mandatory provisions the purpose of this act is to talk about domestic arbitration international commercial arbitration foreign awards so part 1 will talk about india seated arbitration part 2 will talk about foreign awards part 3 will talk about conciliation i'll explain the scheme of this act once again as i said act is divided into mainly three parts part 4 is supplementary and rule making part 1 provides for law relating to domestic arbitration india seated arbitration how the arbitrators will be appointed what shall be the role of court in india seated arbitration what shall be the process to conduct arbitration etc part 2 is enforcement of certain foreign awards now listen to me carefully part 2 is enforcement of certain foreign awards only 
it is not about enforcement of all the foreign awards. There can be three kinds of foreign awards. One, Geneva Convention Awards, which is regulated by the 1937 Act. Second, New York Convention Award, which is regulated by the 1961 Act. And third, Non-Convention Awards, which and, and a foreign award which neither falls in this definition, Geneva Convention definition, nor falls in New York Convention definition. Such awards are non-convention awards. Now, out of these three, the present act in part two is concerned with enforcement of only these two, that is Geneva Convention awards and New York Convention awards. It is not concerned with enforcement of non-convention awards. That is the reason why the title of part two is enforcement of certain foreign awards. I will quickly tell you that part two has got two chapters. The 1961 Act has been reenacted in the form of chapter one of part two. The 1937 Act has been reenacted as chapter two of part two. Part three relates to conciliation. Part four, as I said, relates to rulemaking and, and supplementary provisions. This Arbitration Conciliation Act has been amended twice significantly. There has been three amendments. 2015 amendment and 2019 amendment of the Act will be discussed in, in, in later lectures. The Act was, the constitutionality of this Act was challenged way back in the year 2000 in the case of Babar Ali versus Union of India, where the court upheld the constitutional validity of this Act. So this is the background, this is the history, this is how the law evolved in its present form. Next session onwards, we will start our discussion on more specific aspects of what is arbitration, what is an arbitral award. That's it for, 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 for now. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. And here I am not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize uh, long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and, or college exams. But I am also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors. Tolstoy, for instance, considered the writings of Shakespeare to be, and I quote, crude, immoral, vulgar, and senseless. George Bernard Shaw absolutely loathed Shakespeare, as he did Homer. But perhaps no other criticism about Shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that Shakespeare is a marvelous storyteller, provided someone has told him the story earlier. Now, this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true. None of Shakespeare's plays contain any original story whatsoever. They are all written using pre-existing materials, pre-existing stories. Now, does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare as a dramatist? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippets. <laughs>